Welcome everyone to the 2021 Concordia Annual Summit. My name is Hannah Delman. I'm Senior Director of Partnerships here at Concordia. It's my real pleasure to kick off today's strategic dialogue, Practicalities of Partnership Building. I know I'm not supposed to have a favorite programming set. It's sort of like children, right? And we have this amazing summit, all these great speakers. This is my favorite set. I think it really embodies the mission of what Concordia goes towards, which is strengthening the partnering ecosystem. And every year we, in partnership with the University of Virginia Darden School of Business, Institute for Business and Society, and the United States Department, uh, wait, Well. Office of Global Partnerships hosts the P3 Impact Award, which is a year-round project of accessing amazing partnerships from around the world, working with phenomenal partnering practitioners to understand what makes those partnerships so successful, and then at the Concordia Annual Summit each fall, working through a final round of evaluations and announcing the winner. So that's what this strategic dialogue is all about. It's about hearing from our five finalists. It's about hearing from our five amazing judges and seeing where the cards lie. Um, with that, uh, this being the eighth year that we are doing this P3 Impact Award, it's my real pleasure to turn over to Tomas DeBass, Managing Director of the State Department's Office of Global Partnerships, to tell us more about who's with us today. Tomas? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's kind of crazy to see her in front of me and on the, on the screen. So it's kind of <laughs> devil's back. Whoa. Uh, but thank you. This is, um, this is an amazing, I can't believe it's been eight years. Uh, and uh, Mary Margaret, uh, I, we miss you here in person. I wish I can give you a hug, but a virtual hug to you. Um, but thank you for everyone for joining us today. As uh, Hannah just mentioned, my name is Thomas DeBus, in case uh, I haven't got a chance to meet you. I am the uh, Managing Director of the Office of Global Partnerships at the U.S. Department of State. It's mouthful, I understand, for <laughs> Hannah. It is, I also have a hard time saying it. Um, but uh, I'm honored here to be here today, especially to be here in person after this pandemic lockdown and be, uh, to see familiar faces um, and, and to be with partners uh, in this eight-year journey that we've been with the Darden School of uh, uh, Business at UVA and, and, and our friends here at Concordia. Um, uh, and we, as an office, the Office of Global Partnerships, our job is to collaborate and to partner with, uh, with uh, you know, outside parties, with what we call non-state actors to advance our foreign policy. There is nothing more powerful um, and more timely than partnerships, as we've seen it with the pandemic, with the climate challenges we're facing and all these wicked problems that we're facing around the world, the idea of collaborating and partnering with the private sector is no longer this kind of kumbaya element. It's actually a national security uh, uh, you know, status. And because of that, President Biden actually, uh, I think November, it was February 9th, I think, uh, earlier in the administration within weeks, they put out um, a presidential memo that actually stipulated that this administration will do everything that they can through partnerships. So this is uh, an amazing kind of start for, for the next four years. Uh, the, the Biden-Harris administration has showed their, their commitment to the cause, to the partnership cause, and we look forward to collaborating with of every one of you. And obviously, welcome to the 2021 um, Impact Award uh, for Strategic Partnerships and this dialogue. Uh, which we'll uh, uh, looking forward to hear from our five finalists this about uh, all the part, all the good stuff that they're doing around the partnership uh, arena. Uh, uh, we are once again very humbled by all the applicants to this year's Impact Award, Peace for Impact Award, uh, which recognizes leading um, uh, public-private partnerships around the world. Through this session, we hope to connect trends uh, uh, and and best practices and. And from these finalists, and we hope also you, you will collaborate with each other and, and feed from each other's energy to see how uh, you being here, the five finalists, uh, you're not, we're not saying you've, we, you've reached the promised land, but we're recognizing that you are on the path of righteousness, so to speak, uh, to get there. So we hope that you will be passing lessons to each other as you continue to kind of perfect your, uh, your partnership um, uh, craft. Um, we are amazed by your resiliency, your innovation, your ingenuity, uh, which really highlights why cross-sector cross collaboration is being at its best. Uh, I'm excited to hear uh, 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 one last time from all the finalists this. Congratulations to all of you. You have already won. Uh, this is going to give you a win behind your back. Uh, and uh, I commit from the Department of State's perspective that anything that you need 
for your growth, for whatever you need, uh, you, have, you would have us at hello. So please uh, uh, reach out to us. And before I, I pass in the microphone to my partner in crime, Mary Margaret, um, I want to acknowledge on behalf of our, the entire consortium here, uh, the judges uh, who, who are taking the time to uh, not only to read and, and review, but also give you feedback is uh, Daniel Baker from ADP, uh, Wright Bottle from PPS, Veronica Chow from uh, BCG, Beth Horowitz from Visa, and Algene Sanjay from my old agency, DFC. So thank you for your service, for your time. And uh, without no further delay, uh, I wanna pass the microphone to Mary Margaret. Thank you, Tomas, I really appreciate it. And again, I think it's worth repeating that we're in our eighth year. Uh, who would have known eight years ago that this is where we would be with the global impact that we're having. So I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, it's, I am so sad not to be in New York right now. Um, teaching uh, my first job <laughs> has left me here to welcome you virtually and welcome five amazing uh, partnerships that are just doing amazing things, wonderful things around the world. The first one, uh, Cambodia Rural Sanitation Development Impact Bond. The second, M Salud Mesoamerica Initiative. The third, Standard Microgrid and Zambian Rural Electrification Authority. The fourth, the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund. And finally, Beyond Extraction, Economic Opportunities in Mining Communities. And I just want to thank you all for submitting. It's my favorite thing to do um, with my academic interest in this space is to read the innovation and creative things you all are coming up with. I talk about them all the time in class. Uh, so you are not just doing great things currently, but you're also feeding the minds of future generations. So thank you. Back to you, Hannah. Great, thank you so much, Tomas and Mary Margaret. Um, how today is gonna work, we're gonna hear from each of the five finalist partnerships. They've submitted presentations and then we'll have after each presentation, a short Q&A led by our judges who wanna dig in a little bit deeper about some of the elements of those partnerships. So that is the way we'll cover the first half and then we'll go into an open discussion. So all my partnering practitioners who are observing this dialogue live or the recording, this is a great chance to really see those trends that Tomas was mentioning and see how the arc of partnerships is shaping and evolving these challenge sets that the global community is facing and how resiliency or innovation is taking part in their ability to weather the challenges that COVID-19 has brought about. So this is just, in my opinion, a really just kind of learning rich discussion set. I hope Mary Margaret likes that as well for her academic purposes. And it's just gonna be a great chance to connect um, within the news feed element of doing this. We do encourage people to put in their questions. We'll be able to see those. The SpotMe team is gonna send those over to us. So if you have questions for the partnerships, put them in. We'll either answer them on the spot or we'll follow up on them. And uh, also in the news feed, we're gonna be able to see some really great blog posts about each of these partnerships. So if you wanna go deeper into what they're doing, if the five minutes video and then the Q and A just wasn't enough for you, you've got to learn more about X. Um, those are amazing resources as well. So make sure you're checking the news feed, actively engaged in there. Um, to kick us all off, we're gonna hear, first hear from the Cambodia Rural Sanitation Development Impact Bond. I love a good impact bond. And so I am going to go off camera. I am going to elevate Mr. Paul Gunstenson to talk to us about this great work that's happening. And uh, over to you, Paul. Well, actually, over to the video. <laughs> Poor sanitation and open defecation contributes to the spread of diarrhea and illness within communities, reducing overall quality of life and is a major contributor to child malnutrition. IDE began sanitation marketing in 2011 in six provinces in Cambodia, training business owners in how to construct and install latrines 
and engaging sales agents to go from village to village to educate people on the dangers of open defecation and the importance of latrines. With the support of the Cambodian government, sanitation coverage increased from 20% to nearly 80% in just eight years in the provinces where IDE worked. We are thrilled to get to 80% coverage, but 80% is not enough. In order to reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of total sanitation for everyone, we need to get to at least 85%. We've run a great race, but we knew in order to end open defecation, we needed a special push to reach the finish line. We've been partnering with IDE for well over a decade and wanted to support them to achieve 85% sanitation coverage in the provinces where they work. We also saw an opportunity to provide innovative financing through a development impact bond to achieve this. A structure that enables us to play to our strengths by providing high-risk capital to IDE to enable them to get to the finishing line. A development impact bond, or DIB, is a finance mechanism to achieve a specific social benefit or goal. A DIB requires three types of partner. First, an impact investor who provides funds considered at risk to deliver a chosen social goal. Second, an implementer who conducts activities to achieve the goal. And third, an outcome funder who is willing to reimburse the investor when the goal is achieved. The Cambodian Rural Sanitation Development Impact Bond brings together three organizations, IDE, our foundation, and USA, in a partnership designed to support rural Cambodians on their journey towards self-reliance. The goal selected by the Development Impact Bond is to support 1,600 villages to claim for open defecation-free status, which is the outcome of an innovative and in-depth set of activities led by IDE in partnership with villages, village elders and the local government. The Cambodia Rural Sanitation Development Impact Bond supports the U.S. government's goal of supporting all Cambodians to live a healthy life. Using a private sector approach, this DIB develops market-based solutions to achieve universal sanitation coverage in Cambodia, reducing stunting among children and preventing the spread of disease and contamination of drinking water. The DIB was exactly what we needed. Flexible financing dependent not on how we did the work, but on delivering results. And the best bit is the development impact bond is really working. To date, IDE has enabled 750 villages to claim open defecation free status. That's 46% of our target, with another 850 villages planned over the next two years. <laughs> With big risks come big rewards. Partnering with IDE and USAID is having huge social impact, with an estimated 500,000 people benefiting to date. We're delighted with how the partnership is delivering transformational change in Cambodia. I'm happy to jump in with a question. Uh, uh, again, Dan Baker, and, and thank you to uh, Concordia and the State Department and Darden for uh, convening this award. Um, this is you know, an amazing partnership in Cambodia. I suppose my, my question, maybe just a, even a, a clarification, uh, the, the video mentioned the, the women that were going around to different villages, uh, referred to them as sales agents. Uh, my question is, what are they, what are they selling? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Dan. Thanks very much. And just yeah, momentarily, just want to say thanks to the to the judges for the opportunity to uh, present the the development impact bond on a global to a global audience. So, so the rural sanitation program uh, is sanitation marketing program uh, is an approach to uh, 
promoting the uptake of latrines using uh, market-based approaches. So uh, IDE has, over the last 10 years, worked in partnership with sales agents who conduct house-to-house -house selling, uh, but also um, uh, community-level uh, sales um, uh, events, and then works in partnerships with um, local manufacturers of latrines to uh, meet that demand that's, that's generated. So uh, what IDE has successfully done over the last uh, 10 years has is effectively enabled 320,000 latrines to be delivered and installed in Cambodia, which is a you know, huge social impact. The challenge they were facing to which this development impact bond responds is that you know, as they were uh, getting to 70, 80% coverage in some of the areas, they were finding it harder to reach the most marginalized, the poorest of the poor. And so this did provides the flexibility within the programming to enable them to pivot their, their work, to, to try different means and different methods to reach the, the, the poorest of the poor, and also to achieve the public health benefits that come from whole villages, whole districts, whole communes having access to, to household sanitation. So they're they're selling latrines, but they the the poorest of the poor still need to pay for it on an ongoing basis. Yes. No. So uh, the, what the video was highlighting was the, the the program that's happened to date. What the DIB now focuses on is how do you take that approach and continue to deliver it, but recognize that a market only based approach will, won't necessarily reach the poorest of the poor. And so what IDE, what the DIB has done is supported a program pivot by IDE, which brings in a number of different activities, including different payment plans, a subsidy, a targeted subsidy approach, but also then working with the, the, the local government from the village level up to, to uh, apply for ODF status. That's a government led process which has very clear criteria um, and is a, is a mark of, of, of kind of the status of that village, if you like. And so it's, a, it's an aspirational goal that most villages and most districts and most communes are trying to achieve. Um, in terms of the purchase of the latrine, it's, you know, there is a one-off cost. Uh, pit latrines are kind of a physical asset cost. Um, but what the sector has done really successfully in Cambodia, which has enabled this really huge transformational change, is a lot of collective action around designing one type of pit latrine um, that, uh, that, that is very low cost, very low cost to sell and very low cost to install, but highly effective. Thank you. This is Rhett with PPS. I wanted to zoom out a little bit. I would love to just hear like, what do you feel like is the most effective part of this partnership? But then also on the other end, where do you see areas? What, what is the biggest gap or area for potential improvement? Yeah, I think the, um, the most effective part of this partnership, I think, is just the alignment of both in terms of the social goal that, that, that lies at the heart of it. Um, the three different partners collectively agreed that that social goal was something uh, that we all wanted to strive for. Um, I mean, clearly, at, we're a funder, we're an impact investor, so you know, IDE is active on the ground and implementing. Um, you know, I think that alignment, the alignment in our thinking, the sharing of risk between the different partners and each partner playing to its comparative advantage you know as an impact investor foundation you know we're best placed to take risk um so and you know that's the role we're playing in this we're, we're taking the financial risk ide taking the operational risk in a sense but they're well placed to do that and what usaid is then able to do is it's you know they're a they're they're then able to provide uh, U.S. taxpayers' money in the most effective and, and, and cost-efficient way. Um, you know, in terms of the challenges, I think you know, we've partnered with IDE for well over 10 years, and I think one of the challenges around that is, um, you know, there's been a shift in our role and our relationship, um, and, and you know, that took a little bit of negotiation up front, but I think that's been a really positive way of building on the trust that exists within the partnership. Um, and I think we spent quite a long time you know, on the ground talking and, and, and negotiating and agreeing the scope of the DIB, which has enabled us to then move into implementation really successfully. So. Great. Well, thank you so much to Paul and congratulations to um, the finalist partnership, the Cambodian Rural Sanitation Development Impact Bond. We'll move next to Salud Mesoamerica Initiative, hearing first via a presentation and then going into a question and answer with Emma Margarita. Thanks.
una niña de 13 años no está preparada. Muchas piensan, a mí no me va a pasar. Eso es algo real, eso es algo que está ahí. Se podría considerar como una epidemia en la región latinoamericana. Es muy común. Sí, en realidad sí. Este es un problema que nos concierne a todos. Cassandra, ¿es el momento para ser mamá? Unequal access to quality health services for mothers, babies, and adolescents in Latin America is an important challenge. Mesoamerica is one of the most unequal regions on the planet. Indigenous women are three times more likely to die during pregnancy, birth, or postpartum. Access to quality maternal care could prevent one of every two maternal deaths. In Latin America, the poorest teenagers are three to four times more likely to become pregnant compared to the richest quintile. The child of a mother without education is three times more likely to die before its first birthday. What if we could improve lives of these women, adolescents, and babies by supporting governments to improve their effectiveness, efficiency, and quality of care through revolutionary blending financing and management models? Answering this question is at the heart of the Salud Mesoamerica Initiative, an innovative public-private partnership. The Inter-American Development Bank joined forces with public and private sector partners to create an alliance where strengths and resources of the partners complement each other to close the health equity gaps and prevent needless deaths in 1.8 million women and children of the poorest 20% of Mesoamerica. Salud Mesoamerica focuses on collective impact, measurable results, and government's commitment and ownership. It brings together the innovation, financing, and expertise of the Inter-American Development Bank, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Carlos Slim Foundation, the governments of Canada and Spain, and eight governments of Mesoamerica. The initiative innovates by implementing a results-based financing model in which countries and donors share the costs and the risks. When countries achieve 80% of the coverage and quality targets, they receive a cash incentive equal to 50% of their contribution. After nine years, the results have been remarkable. Improvements in coverage and quality of care have reduced the health equity gap bringing health care for the poor closer to, and sometimes above, the national average. For example, in Honduras, hospital births increased from 76% to 90%, surpassing the national average of 83%. In Costa Rica, a reduction of 11.4% in adolescent fertility can be directly attributed to Salud Mesoamerica's intersectorial approach. In El Salvador, there is an increase of 35% in preventive checkups, resulting in a reduction of 12% in hospitalizations attributable to Salud Mesoamerica. In Nicaragua, quality of routine neonatal care improved by more than 35 percentage points. Or in Belize, the application of oxytocin to prevent deaths due to bleeding after childbirth increased from 60% to 99%. Salud Mesoamerica has the lives of children and women at heart. They are the passion that drives our actions. Salud Mesoamerica has proven to be a successful mechanism to close the health equity gaps. We all have experienced the power of the partnership and the importance of developing a trusted and transparent relationship to solve problems together. We all have experienced the transformational force of governments, their leadership, their ownership to make changes in their populations. We have come back to the basics, listening to the people's need and paying attention to the community practices and knowledge. The Salud Mesoamerica Initiative model could be scalable and adaptable to any region in the world and to other sectors. It empowers governments and citizens to trigger life-changing opportunities, contributing to ending generational cycles of poverty and preventing other consequences like marginalization, violence, or forced migration. When women do not have access to healthcare services, people's lives are affected. Dear members of the jury, 
We are not talking about cases. We are not talking about numbers. We are talking about people. You could be talking about me. Terrific. Uh, I'll just start the questions off. Congratulations to the entire team at this initiative. It's really, really compelling. I would love to hear more about the results-based financing component, noting that it's a particularly innovative structure for how you've gold these partners together. Can you speak more about how that was structured and some of the lessons learned, uh, both, both positive as well as you know, some of the more constructive things that have been learned along the way about using a, an RBF mechanism? Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Good afternoon. Um, the results by financing model included donation funding from the foundations and the governments of Canada and Spain, but also a domestic budget from the countries. So meaning that countries needed to contribute in cash, not in kind to cover the cost of the, of the interventions in the program. Since this is a program of uh, eight countries, it's already at the scale. Yeah, so because we are covering the 20% uh, um, poorest populations in these countries. Uh, the fact that countries are contributing with that from their domestic budget is really important in terms of sustainability. Because, you know, once, once they are allocating um, uh, the funding to these populations and to the activities either in prevention or treatment, uh, is, is they need to open a line in the national budget. And this is then it's more difficult to take out this budget once it is allocated. And for example, we can tell you that at the beginning, the per capita all allocated to this poorest population was less, yeah, around um, is $18 per capita. And now it's around 22 and 25, depending on the countries. And that has been maintained over the years with their own funding. Moreover, for example, a, a couple of countries have already finished their uh, operations with Salud Mesoamerica. In the last th two years, they have been funding with domestic funding the gains that they um, could um, uh, achieve during the, the life of the operations under Salud Mesoamerica. Uh, also, um, since this resource-based financing model is a little bit different than other ones in terms of that the incentive goes to the national system to the national level. It doesn't go to the providers, you know, individually. And that is really important in terms of um, facilitating system performance and, and from the central to the, to the, to the local levels in terms also in system sustainability and improving and maintaining coverage and quality, which is another uh, characteristics. It's not based um, on, on outputs, yeah, on, on activities. It's based on outcome level uh, results. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm Algene Sadri from the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. I find this project to be very interesting, and I really, um, uh, really uh, also was going to ask a question about the lessons learned from uh, the 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 type of the design of the project. Um, and I think really what's innovative too is is because you have the uh, country with skin in the game, there is the potential for, you know, skills transfer, um, health system strengthening and more broadly. Um, and I think, you know, getting that country buy-in is, is, is critical. Um, what over the life of the uh, program thus far have you learned as far as um, the ability to impact um, a government uh, uh, investments in this sector, um, you know, skills transfer, training, um, and and how have you been able to um, use this model, and and will you be able to replicate it? I know there's in the discussion, um, in the in the beautiful actual video, there was a lot of discussion about the. Um, there's a little bit of discussion about the the model being um, replicated elsewhere. Um, where do you see it going next? Yeah, thank you. I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that this partnership has worked out 
two ways, you know, from top to bottom and bottom to top, because it was important to have these partners, which are very different, you know, a bank, a multilateral bank, eight countries and governments, and two foundations and two bilateral governments with bilateral uh, relationship with, with these countries as well. So even though we had the same objective, uh, you can imagine the challenges of getting together on the how, how to do this. And even though the results-based financing is based on results, in this case, we decided for a hands-on approach. Why? Because it's really important, as you were saying, Algin, to uh, support countries to develop the capacities, not only to set targets at a national level, but also at the subnational and local level. What does it mean for me as a nurse, as a health promoter, that my country needs to reduce one third of the maternal death, of the, of the neonatal death? What does it mean here? It means achieving, enriching, I'm sorry, a, 15 women yeah, uh, uh, this year that are pregnant. And I look for those women. And please remember that we are talking about the most vulnerable and hardest to reach population. There is no roads infrastructure there. Hospitals are really far away. So they really need to reach those women and prepare themselves in case for complications to go out. So collective impact, which was our, let's say, theoretical model, uh, uh, we work very hard with the partners, including, of course, the countries, on having very clear targets together. We agree on those targets, and we also agree on how to do the hands-on approach, especially working at the subnational levels. But also, we agree on um, experimenting and admitting failures. Otherwise, it's really difficult if we are going to only collecting evidence just to report that everything is okay. And the governments have had the challenge, you know, because for decades they have been only reporting from the subnational levels to the national levels where the analysis are happening and the, decision, the decisions are made. In this case, all of us, including governments, need to change the way at, at we are looking at the problems, using the problem-driven um, problem iterative approaches, because we think that we know the, what the problem is, but it's not the case. When we go to the local level, we understand that the problems are related, not necessarily to financing, not necessarily to technical issues, but to dynamics on how we are organized, the motivations on how teams go outside looking for this baby, looking for this mother, or for this teenager. And those motivational, organizational issues around not only individual behaviors, but the system collective behaviors is what we think can bring, along with catalytic funding, along with very tailored technical assistance, could, could, could um, get those systems up to the task of uh, a, a, a decreasing this health equity gap. We are talking about hardest to reach population, indigenous populations. Great. Thank you so much, Anna, and to your entire partnership through SMI. Congratulations on connecting those metrics back to policy across so many key nationals. Um, we're switching to a different Thank region, you. a different uh, development challenge set, and we will be turning over to Clement to learn more about the partnership between Standard Microgrid and the Zambian Rural Electrification Authority. So first with the video and then into a great Q&A about energy access. The Rural Electrification Authority in Zambia was made as a special purpose vehicle to deliver electrification in the rural areas. And at the time that uh, the act was being enacted in 2003, the electrification rate in the countryside was at 3%. And the target was uh, by 2030, we should be sitting at 51% electrification. Now, to do electrification over a wide expanse like uh, this country requires a lot of resources, and it also requires planning. So part of the planning came through the Rural Electrification Master Plan that identified 1,217 rural growth centers. As we went along, we discovered that there were other players in the space. 
who were not necessarily doing rural electrification, but they were out there to uplift the lives of the people in the countryside. One of them was the Zambia Cooperative Federation. Our mandate as an institution is to promote the development of cooperative enterprises in Zambia. These are communal businesses. At the moment, we have uh, more than 60,000 primary cooperative societies in this country. In uh, 2015, I think, or 16, we came up with a, a project to roll out uh, uh, solar milling plants uh, to build the capacity of cooperatives in, in the provinces. We realized that the solar milling plant was producing more energy than the energy needed to run the mill itself. And so we said the excess energy which is being wasted was seven uh, kilowatts. And we were saying these seven kilowatts can be used for, for other things. And one of them was that we should power houses, give electricity to houses. So when we looked at our situation that we did not have sufficient resources to be able to handle this mandate, we thought we could synergize and ride on what uh, Zambia Cooperative Federation was providing. And they had provided this in large numbers, 1,600 mills around the country. So we thought uh, we should look more closely at this and we discovered uh, to our amazement that uh, in fact the 1,600 uh, uh, milling plants around the country were mostly coinciding with our 1,200 rural growth centers. So that's how that collaboration was born. But we still needed something else, which was we needed a platform with modern technology, with a novel solution to be able to sustain our operations. And that's when we partnered with uh, Standard Microgrid Zambia. Standard Microgrid in Zambia has been operating in Zambia um, for a few years now, uh, looking at uh, putting in uh, solar mini grids to um, electrify rural communities within Zambia. In order to achieve our projects on the ground, uh, the Standard Microgrid has to work with the rural electrification very closely. Um, the reasons for this is to uh, support with the rural electrification master plan. As part of this public-private partnership that we're working with for rural electrification, we also are working with uh, Zambia Cooperative Farmers, ZCF, who um, implemented a project some years ago for introducing solar milling plants to rural, rural communities. Standard Microgrid, with their work with RIA, have identified excess power that's been produced by these solar milling projects, and we have proposed to reticulate the excess power into the local communities, therefore achieving mandates for both RIA and for ZCF. We've recently completed a project in a place called Kampaketi village in Chongwe district where we've uh, in, implemented a pilot project to, to achieve this. Uh, that project is uh, undergoing commissioning at the moment and we, we, we hope to, to start generating revenue through the local community but also of, um, delivering affordable power to the local communities. Uh, this is a pilot project and we intend to continue working with RIA and with the ZCF uh, to continue to do this throughout the country. Wow. Well, I'm I'm happy to jump in with a with a question. I I really, um, yeah, I'm really inspired by this partnership. I think sometimes uh, electrification projects can be uh, jobs and and education in disguise. And I'm and I'm wondering, uh, in addition to the metrics on businesses connected. Uh, are, are there any um, data points now around uh, either new jobs created or new businesses started with that additional electrical capacity that you're bringing to the community? Uh, thank you for that question. And uh, uh, yes, the project that we are talking about is now about uh, two months old. So in terms of uh, jobs created directly at uh, Kampikete, uh, that one would have to say we have to wait and see. But the uh, notion that we've put around the 
uh, solar milling plant. It is actually one of making it a rural business hub that is going to have modern um, services through a banking kiosk. We also have um, uh, little uh, businesses that are running and uh, the complicated area. We counted already businesses that were set up even before we went there. There are 16 businesses out of the 70 that we have connected so far at uh, site. We have a school, we also have a clinic nearby. Uh, I'll jump in with a question as well. Again, my, my congratulations to everyone involved in this partnership. Could you speak to the outlook in terms of the sustainability, both for the installations that have been made thus far, but as you think about even the, the durability of, of this partnership itself, what is that outlook? Uh, the outlook uh, looks very good. And um, we are seated looking at uh, a project that is going to roll out the standard microgrid around to the extent of 250 sites over the next four years. The uh, milling projects, like I was saying at the beginning, uh, 1,600 across the country. So whatever we do here, uh, then gets scaled up into that space of 1,600 uh, milling plants. Uh, what is uh, sustainable about this? Uh, traditionally, electricity utilities have sold power through uh, kilowatt hours. That is what they premise their business to be on. And uh, to our partnership, that kind of uh, business is problematic in that for spaces such as the one that we are talking about, that uh, has a challenge in terms of the amount of money that they have to spend on energy. We are going to have the situation where we are forcing people to buy kilowatt hours that they are not really utilizing. I'll give an example of um, uh, a favorite meal around here, which is uh, uh, driving, which uh, we've discovered can be cooked with uh, new electrical appliances in just 7% of the energy that it normally takes to cook uh, this particular meal. Now, if I'm um, a normal utility, I'm not selling via the platform that we are talking about here, which is the end use, then I will be hard put to say, I will only be selling 7% of uh, the electricity that I normally do, and it's going to affect my turnover. But on this particular platform of power time, uh, that's a, a notion it's similar to the way you talk about cable TV and the programs there. Yeah, so on this particular platform, we are going to have a situation where we say to ourselves, the 93% gain, yes, should go to the participants in the program and the key participants are the suppliers of electricity and also the users of electricity. So for argument's sake, if say initially it was uh, going to cost these people one dollar for a kilowatt hour and with the platform that we have which has control all the way to the uh, electrical socket, uh, we are going to say the gain to them will be 93%. But instead of getting all that to be put on the uh, customer and basically consume the capital, so to speak, because there'll be no money to reinvest, we are going to cut that to half and say that the benefit to them is going to be 43% and the benefit to us will also be uh, commensurate at 50%. And that reinvestment will then uh, drive the business forward and make it uh, more sustainable. So there is a big gain to them, but it also ensures that the business continues to run. 
And uh, the other benefit also is that uh, on a network that has visibility of that kind, we have very few faults. In fact, where well, we've applied this before with our uh, standard microgrid, uh, there has been uh, a record of almost no faults in a period of uh, three years. Yeah, and uh, that is a big gain. In fact, it's uh, like uh, amazing to anybody in uh, uh, rural distribution of power. Great, thank you so much, Clement. It's truly um, impressive, the sustainability of that partnership and the, the reach that you've been able to have with your pricing model. So congratulations to both you and Standard Microgrid on the work you're doing. Um, Next, we will turn to 100,000 Strong in the Americas or the 100K Innovation Fund with, um, with Maggie Hug joining us from the State Department. Maggie? Young people across the United States, Latin America, and the Caribbean are entering a globalized workforce with an ever-increasing demand for global competencies. Despite the potential benefits, opportunities for educational exchange within the Americas have not been widely accessible or robust when compared with other world regions. The 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund was formed and launched to catalyze a transformation because when we study together, and we learn together, we work together, and we prosper together. That's what I believe. With limited financing schemes, weak intra-regional academic networks, and significant barriers to student access, opportunities for international education and training exchange between the U.S. and LAC countries are too often limited to a privileged few. Under the vision of 100,000 Strong, the U.S. Department of State convened stakeholders from multiple sectors for a dialogue that emerged as a long-term commitment for a new model. The result was a dynamic public-private partnership between the U.S. government, U.S. embassies, partners of the Americas, NAFSA, Association of International Educators, and commitments from private, public, and higher education contributors to the 100,000 Strong Innovation Fund. The Innovation Fund is the catalyst that drives public-private partnerships based on shared interests and values. We're expanding access to educational opportunities with our partners in the region. This makes sense geographically, culturally, and economically. Cuando nos explicaron por primera vez que era 100,000 strong in the Americas, estábamos tan entusiasmados que de inmediato decidimos participar. La prosperidad en nuestros países necesita que el éxito de nuestras empresas contemple el bienestar integral para sus trabajadores y sus comunidades. Desde Agroamérica, Estamos convencidos que el futuro de nuestro continente pasa por inversiones estratégicas como estas. Here's how it works. For each innovation fund competition, we develop a public-private partnership with one or more private companies or country governments to identify strategic academic themes that are central to the region's workforce development needs. So teams of colleges and universities, and we're talking at least one in the US and at least one in Latin America or the Caribbean, work together to propose innovative, sustainable exchange programs that offer underrepresented students in the US and abroad an opportunity to study and train internationally. Seven years, between 2013 and 2021, the Department of State's commitments have leveraged an additional $14 million public, private, and academic sectors, over 55% from sources outside the U.S. government. To date, the Innovation Fund has awarded 264 grants to 515 institutions in 25 countries and 49 U.S. states. From Vancouver to Tierra del Fuego, perhaps most important, 100,000 strong partnerships and programs are inclusive. Earlier this year, a major independent impact study by the Inter-American Dialogue confirmed that 100,000 strong student cohorts are consistently more diverse than other academic exchange programs, with racial minority students participating at a rate that is 52 percentage points higher. 
creo que es una experiencia absolutamente completa, transversal. Te cambia la forma de ver las cosas, te, a, te hace relacionarte con gente diferente, te hace ver el mundo de una manera distinta. Aprendí sobre energía, aprendí sobre minería, aprendí conocimientos técnicos, aprendí a abrir la mente, aprendí a ver las comunidades aborígenes de una manera totalmente distinta. Aprendí a, a entender que cada cosa tiene su significado y cada uno de nosotros puede ver un significado distinto. 100,000 Strong no es solo un programa de gobierno de la Universidad de Estados lo que estamos tratando de hacer aquí es crear algo más, como ha dicho Ben, algo más que un programa de gobierno. Estamos tratando de crear una sinergia, una nueva sinergia entre los sectores privados, charities, universidades y todos los gobiernos en el hemisferio. Para invertir en enviar estudiantes a y de los Estados Unidos, para aumentar las barreras financieras y logísticas, las barreras de lengua y las barreras de información que ahora están en el Maybe I can jump in with a question. Hopefully I'm not hogging too many questions, but I'm, I'm so curious, Maggie, because it's it was a, such a uh, informative video and, and so much information there. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the private sector partners because in the, in the award application, there were so many companies listed and a lot of those were charitable foundations, of course. Um, some of them were, were companies. And I'm curious around the 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 role and dependency of companies in the in the partnership and what your outlook is on their continued engagement and the sustainability of the partnership with respect to the companies involved. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dan. And a quick thanks to Concordia and also to the judges and to the P3 team for providing this incredible platform for all of our teams to present and talk about how we're partnering and how we're using utilizing P3 partnerships uh, to change communities in the world, as you say. So along your, your point, your question is a great one, Dan. And what, we, I've, what I wanna back up and start by saying is, you know, with presidential mandates, we don't always have a roadmap. And I also wanna start off by saying that this was a major, has been and continues to be a major team effort across sectors. We started basically at zero over 10 years ago and the innovation fund, the 100,000 Strong in America's 100K innovation fund really came together because we are saying, okay, how can we create partnerships that will widen the arteries for opportunities for youth in the United States and in Latin America to come together to work in teams to solve real world problems? And how can we also build institu institutional capacity at the same time? And so one of the things, um, as you saw in the video, is that with it really is an incredible testimony to this P3 partnership, this particular model, where from an investor's perspective, it, whether you're from the public sector or the private sector or the higher education sector, your dollars are being doubled. In other words, if we think about the investment, let's say from the Department of State side, from the Bureau of Western Hemisphere and writ large across the State, the State Department, with roughly seven, seven, five million over seven, over a little bit over eight years, that's generated and has helped to attract and leverage almost double from, more than double, from pub, public sector, from higher education institutions. And every, each of these sectors has skin in the game to then create opportunities that didn't exist before. There are students from the United States and from Latin America that have never been on planes, never had the opportunity to be able to work in teams at their home institution, much less in an intercambio, in an exchange, in a, ho in, in a host institution. And I would also like to say, you know, this is one, one of the things that our private sector friends and, and our family members, as we call them, the donor partners, one of the things they like is that there's this flexibility. There's a flexibility in terms of themes. There's a flexibility in terms of the institutions. There's a flexibility in terms of who can benefit these teams of students, these underserved students in the United States and in Latin America. We are together across sectors creating 
the 100K Innovation Fund is a driver of opportunity and of diversity. Uh, and we've been at this for well over seven years, and that's going to keep going. And just coming into Concordia Summit, we have new partners who have said they're very excited to continue partnering with us. Fantastic. Um, thank you uh, for, for this wonderful presentation. I'm really enjoying um, this, this um, event because I feel like I'm learning so much about um, the new and different ways um, that uh, partnerships are being formed mm -hmm. and how they're helping our friends in the developing world. I really um, love this model. I think there's a really important um, piece that you said and mentioned just now on diversity um, and, and um, Mark, you know, I, I would love to hear more about how you're targeting and reaching marginalized communities um, uh, in the in the Western Hemisphere, and how how what's the plan for that, and how you and how do you intend to to sort of scale this? Thanks. Thank you. Excellent question. I want to give a a, a very concrete um, uh, example to the, that excellent question. For instance, with the government of Colombia, over the last five to six years, they have invested over 1.2 million. Why? Because it's a national level um, effort to build these partnerships between the U.S. and Colombia. This is a hemispheric wide initiative, but just to give you that, they, the government of Colombia, through four different entities, um, education, um, work related and industries, um, entities, have said, we want to ensure that our students from far-flung areas of the United States and Colombia can come together and work together again in their home institutions and also in this exchange model. And we, quite frankly, are widening the arteries for these students to have this opportunity that they would never have had. We, we have countless anecdotes of how students, it's their first time participating in an international or regional training program. And that's what 100K is doing. 100K is it is this mat it's a cornerstone quite frankly of our regional development strategy working across sectors working with the department of state partners of the americas our embassy it is embedded into the policy of our teams that we want to raise we want to ensure this positive agenda for the hemisphere by championing the power of education to provide opportunities to 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 trans to transform societies and to ensure that inclusive education opportunities. These opportunities wouldn't exist otherwise. We have countless stories of students and not only how this has transformed what they will go on to do as the IED report showed us, this has been catalytic, not only to, to institutional capacity, not only to student development, but also to how students then go on and they are building, using this experience for their own workforce development, which is also making a huge difference across the region. Um, this is a massive shared vision, shared teamwork, shared resilience. Uh, and we're so excited that the, the recent reports have shown us about the diversity and inclusion that has been with us from the beginning and continuing um, with our private sector partners and our public sector partners. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you to the judges and to Maggie for that, for sharing more about 100K Innovation Fund and not the uh, the countries and the societies that are participating in that through the inclusive and diversification um, and the student led program, but the impact it's also having on the private sector entities who are involved in this as we're really building out a pipeline of amazing talent around the world. So congratulations. I keep looking to my right because Maggie's sitting here as well. <laughs> uh, hybrid strange. Um, so with that, we're going to turn to our very next and the final P3 impact finalist for today's discussion set. And this is going to be the Beyond Extraction Economic Opportunities in Mining Communities Partnership with Will Warshaw from TechnoServe speaking. Thanks. Anglo Americans' motivation for joining the Beyond Extraction Partnership was to explore new ways in which we could support sustainable socioeconomic development in the communities around our operations. The people that lives that lives around the mine are usually very dependent on the mine. So this project was designed in order to provide a sustainable source of income to people not to be dependent on the mine anymore. En este sentido, el proyecto integra el profundo conocimiento del BIT en la región, las capacidades técnicas del Tecnoserf para movilizar expertos en el territorio con una mirada puesta en resultados y el compromiso de Anglo American para generar valor compartido en los territorios donde operan. 
The project included three pillars. We work with enterprise development, so we work with entrepreneurial people. We had a second pillar, which was based on job force development, and a third one, which was value chain development. But in addition to the pillars, we were able to include a ecosystem building as part of the design of the project so that the efforts at the end of the project were not going to be loose. And in addition to that, we leveraged the mining value chain. The approach taken by Beyond Extraction was very much tailored to each of the three countries and each of the localities in which we operated. So for example, in Chile, we were looking in particular at technical skills training, uh, whereas in Brazil, we were looking more at economic diversification around our operations. So very much a collaborative approach, drawing on the expertise and experience of the three partners. Uh, and then of course, also uh, seeking extensive stakeholder input. So working with local government, uh, with local businesses uh, and local training institutions, for example. Así que siempre eh, aportamos eh, con Anglo American, con Tecnosurf y con la comunidad local eh, un conocimiento que pudiera ser aplicado, aprovechado también en otros lugares y por otras empresas a través de este proyecto. I think the impact of Beyond Extraction has been quite significant. We actually did achieve the targets we set out for the program, so that was important. But I think also just as importantly, it actually set out a model whereby multilaterals, NGOs and, and, and private companies can work together on private sector development as well. So we all bring something unique to that party that I think is very unusual in the development space uh, and, and very productive because of that. At the end of the day, we were able to touch the lives of 2,500 people participating in the program. They were able to answer the question, how I'm going to be sustainable and how I'm going to have like stable sources of income for me and for my family. A la luz del éxito de la implementación del programa Más Allá de la Extracción, hemos decidido renovar nuestro trabajo conjunto aprovechando las lecciones aprendidas y refinando nuestra estrategia de intervención. Ahora, con el liderazgo del equipo del sector público del recientemente constituido Grupo Especial de Minería, hemos aprobado dos proyectos de cooperación técnica no reembolsables dirigidos a aumentar el impacto en las áreas de intervención enfocado en empleo y en fortalecer pequeñas y medianas empresas y cadenas de valor durante esta época de la pospandemia. Y se trata de temas que están priorizados bajo la visión 2025 del Grupo BID, nuestra estrategia para impulsar la recuperación de la región. Así que vemos que el programa Más Allá de la Extracción sirve de inspiración y sirve de esta primera chispa que nos puede llevar a crear muchos más lazos intersectoriales de largo plazo de beneficio compartido de colaboración para generar valor en todos los países de América Latina y Caribe. I can um, jump in here. Well, tell me a little bit, you know, um, creating jobs and creating sustainable employment for these people is amazing. Um, could it be used and it could it be adapted to um, other areas besides mining? You know, other places where the existing um, industry has, you know, is, is waning or is leaving um, and people are dependent on it. Is, could, could the model be used elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely, Beth. I think it, it, it can and it is. Uh, it, it's a model around adult learning. It's a model that starts with a market diagnostic to sort of understand what the opportunity set looks like and then works uh, on both enterprise development and workforce development as well as ecosystem. And uh, uh, that's where IDB played a huge role in uh, fostering connections with local and regional governments. Uh, and so a lot of the uh, improvements that were made as a part of this partnership, we believe will last because of some of those kinds of changes. So I think this is quite extensible to other, uh, other areas and other industries, but it's particularly relevant for mining where you have this mismatch of, of uh, 
the benefits coming from the mine, the economic benefits and the community uh, around the mine uh, only benefiting typically in a limited way. And even government who's getting taxes, often they don't have, the local governments don't have the authority to spend those taxes in those communities. So um, in that sense, it's particularly powerful. But just to, I wanna just give a quick sense of the government aspect of this. Uh, we worked with a, a series of, uh, a set of cheese producers in Brazil and due to an outdated regulation, they were prohibited from selling their cheese across state lines. There's a much more lucrative sort of artisanal cheese market across a state line that they were cut off from. We helped the cheese producers form an association and that association lobbied the government to take that uh, regulation down. And uh, presto, you have a whole a huge set of new, much more interesting economic opportunities for those cheese producers uh, in a way and their, their association now. So there's a lot there that we believe lasts over time long after the project ends. Good, I'm happy to jump in with another question. Could you share more about Anglo-American and, and how they contributed capabilities? I, I heard him in the video reference that they were leveraging parts of the supply chain. Um, and how do you balance that tension between on one hand, leveraging existing supply chain and footprint versus the beyond uh, of the beyond extraction. Yeah, thanks, Veronica. Uh, and uh, Anglo, we've worked with Anglo in a number of markets, and this happened in three countries in Chile, uh, Peru, um, and Brazil. Um, each one was a little different focus. Um, the mine in Peru was, uh, was just becoming operational, or they were operational in other markets. So the opportunity set was different. Frankly, we, we try our best to leverage both. So there are interesting opportunities for local businesses to plug into that supply chain. And I think Anglo is uh, more than usually willing to be flexible and adaptable to try to make space for those businesses to enter. Um, and then they are supporting uh, financially and otherwise uh, the work that we, we were doing uh, to try to help create other sorts of business opportunities that don't depend on the mine. Uh, so it's really kind of a both and uh, approach there. I do have one also, uh, another question. I really find this really um, a fascinating discussion as well. Um, and I, I really like the question about, you know, how you can replicate this model elsewhere, uh, because, you know, certainly mining itself is a finite uh, business right after the, the mine uh, is uh, um, fully exploited, then, you know, after the 30, 40 years, it's gone. And so it would be good to, it's really good that you're, you know, utilizing this tool to scale other types of, 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 of jobs in the, um, in those regions. Um, but I'm just curious, just because um, at, at DFC, I work on women owned um, uh, enterprises. I also, um, you know, we're partners in the 2X initiative. And um, I see a lot of opportunity here to kind of scale, um, this and, and target women-owned businesses and women entrepreneurs as well as um, uh, women workers, uh, women in the workforce in those communities. I'm just curious if you have targets or uh, around that and you know what you're doing in that space. Um, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, and absolutely, yeah, it was a, it was a, a, a big push on the Beyond Extractive Partnership to focus on women. I'm delighted to say that 60% of the beneficiaries were women. Uh, and it was a very deliberate and, and methodical approach, uh, working, for example, with some businesses in Chile that were fairly hostile to hiring women. And you hear things like, I'm not going to hire women, they got to take maternity leave and all the things that one hears. And through a process of working with them and making the case for the business case for, for more inclusive hiring, uh, helping them start uh, internship programs that, that got women into some of these workplaces, uh, we were able to make real progress and, and to meet the target that more than half of the beneficiaries were women. That team is now being proactively called by other companies that want advice on building a more inclusive workforce. So uh, there's a long way to go, but I think with focus, uh, you can make progress. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Will, for sharing that partnership with us. I am a 
a staunch advocate for anything that uses cross-sector collaboration to expand the cheese industry. So thank you to your great, great work <laughs> there. Um, so at this time, I would love to invite everybody for this um, collaboration to come back onto camera um, and to let's just turn, um, shift gears a little bit, have a bit of a discussion around what we see as some interesting trends or innovations, some really kind of unique findings coming from these five presentations, their phenomenal impact around the world and the way that they've leveraged public-private partnerships to address a myriad of pressing global issues and really kind of expanded the linkages, in my opinion, between one of those. It might have been focused originally around X, but they're seeing that full systems approach to it, right? Which I think is really telling. Um, so I'll just invite folks to jump on in. Um, and if not, I'm happy to keep talking. I'm happy to kick it off. I think one fascinating trend across all of them are just the really innovative approaches that each partnership took to structuring the finances, be it a results-based funding mechanism, development impact bond, um, leveraging you know private sector funders into uh, scholarship programs. Like, and, and I do think that that is going to increasingly be a trend going forward. And I think what these partnerships can can really offer up is going from the uh, conceptual into the nitty gritty and what are some of those harder lessons learned about aligning interests and uh, and outcomes using these different approaches to uh, leveraging private sector capital. And if I may, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, please go. If I may add on that line, Veronica, I think that um, it's very inspiring to, to see all the, the presentation of all the colleagues and finalists. And I think that beyond this formal partnership, there are also a lot of hundreds of partnerships, uh, you know, from the central to the local levels, to the lo from the local levels to the, to the central level that are originated because of that. And I was thinking in Salud Mesoamerica about how a teacher, a health promoter in a community or a community leader, you know, because of this formal, quote unquote, formal partnership, we're working together in, in at, at, a, at a very local level. So I think this is really, really important in what uh, innovations are generated from the local level. And, and to build on what Emma is saying is, um, I absolutely agree that the, the fact that there's so much skin in the game from all the different partners, the, the structures have been set up so that there's skin in the game at the local level, there's skin in the game at every level and in, in every partnership, um, which I think is really, really important. I also thought that I really liked um, the fact that there were clear metrics uh, and that everything was results-based, not activity-based, and that in fact, the results-based, you know, tied to incentives and empowered people to do things they wanted to do, test and learn, et cetera. It was only on the results, not on the how. Um, and really empowering people. I, those are key best practices I was uh, very excited about. Yeah, my, my thought kind of wraps up, I think, where we are, which is just, you know, for those of us who've been working in this space, how far the field has come and sort of the energy and the momentum um, and the scale at which we're seeing these, these partnerships. And I think, you know, as we were talking about sort of the data and measurement pieces, and I think, you know, uh, I was in a conversation earlier this morning, we were talking a little bit about trust of institutions. We're in sort of a perilous moment, right? Where people are unsure about government, sort of the role of public policy. Um, but it's clear um, that the idea of public-private partnerships is on the rise as sort of a solution base. And I think that we're seeing that not only domestically here in the US, but also quite globally as a trusted partner and solution. So I, and, and I think that is manifested uh, in, the, in the five examples that we've seen today. Uh, I think I like build up that and say, um, you know, I think what really impressed me was was the range of the partnerships that, that are here and, and, and sort of demonstrating how these partners can come together for social impact. What, you know, what really struck me is, you know, we had a we, we sort of we had a we had a partnership around health, around livelihoods, around education, around energy. And all of these are the like cornerstones of the, delivering the SDGs. And I think that gives me personally a lot of hope for how partnerships can work in practice and then how you bring in aligning those incentives, aligning the finance around kind of focusing on the social goal. So found this, you know, this session really inspiring. Congratulations to the other finalists. Uh, I really enjoyed watching your videos. 
I, I'd like to move and just say, I think we're going to rename the P, the, the, the organizers of the P3 don't know that we, I think we should come up with a new name, nomenclature, which is perseverance, patience, and passion. I, I know that our team is filled with that perseverance, patience, and passion. And we're all about innovation, creating that wholesale approach and creating opportunities for flexible funding to stir up bureau bureaucracies, bureaucracies within governments, bureaucracies within companies, bureaucracies within education institutions. So this is, I agree with all of our colleagues in this space, this is it's fascinating to what can be done. I think I, I, I would say selfishly, and we know that 100K can, we've been approached by other global regions to see how this can take off in other regions. Um, so that's very exciting. And um, yes, all sectors to, to, I agree a thousand percent with Beth, it's all about the, the, the resources, whether it's in kind, cash, and everybody across sectors making these possibilities happy, making these partnerships and training programs in our case happen. Hey, this is Tomas. Um, uh, yeah, I love those acronyms. That's awesome. Uh, and you've <laughs> added another P, at least in this conversation with performance, because most of the stuff that is happening in these partnerships seems to be performance based. Um, but to go back to uh, Ray's point about um, the the era that we are in is the mistrust of governments and institutions and how almost each of you have um, anchored your collaborations around public institutions, be it be the, the government of Cambodia or USAID or other institutions. That's, um, that's a testament to why, especially in these times of uncertainties and uh, in these challenging times, that... Uh, we lean on each other, uh, uh, both the public and the private sector, to solve these problems. Is uh, you know, for those of us who've been in this business, it's 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 our helping verb. We've been at it for a long time, but to see it mature and it being recognized at this level is a very uh, very very refreshing. Uh, so I echo Red's uh, uh, comment on why you are what what you're doing is is a, a is a drive uh, into that. Um, the other thing that I uh, that that stood to me in terms of out of the five, three of the organizations are in the Latin America region, uh, uh, but historically, at least in the partnerships that we've looked at, Africa has been dominant on at least on the Peace of Impact Award. To see Latin America be represented uh, well is a huge testament of the growth of this type of collaborations in the region. And we hope to see, we hope um, you will be opening up the new, new doors and new windows, so to speak, uh, to uh, to the region in that sense. So congratulations to, 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 to those of you on that. Um, I do have actually a question to, um, uh, I didn't get an opportunity to ask, or I'll, I'll take this opportunity to do so. But I, I was wondering, and I saw some of the videos are recent videos because I've, when I see a mask, I know it's, it's a timely video. <laughs> And these things. So I was wondering, how has the pandemic, uh, or its aftermath, or or it's it's a, it's still it is still with us. But how has that impacted your uh, your ability to create collaborations? Because as we know, partnership is a contact sport. So how do you do that without being able to be, uh, you know, how, how, without with being in the contactless world in that sense? So how has that impacted your and I, this is for all of you, not uh, uh, not just a single of you, but all of you. So I'd love to hear from each of you if you can comment about your the state of your your partnership in, in the times of pandemic. I'm going to jump right in, if that's okay, for a hundred K team to say this. Uh, that one of the good things that we're well, one of the things we're proud about is that we've always had a virtual component to our partnerships and to our programs. So there's always been the virtual component, and if anything, that's just magnified in this pandemic. Further, I would say there is just a massive need. We know that there's a massive need for these innovation fund grants. Um, the private sector was engaged. The public sector is engaged across the region. We have incredible um, private sector partners in Central America and in Mexico um, that see the urgency of making sure that we are we are working together to train, re to give opportunities so that students and faculty and institutions are prepared for the for the demands of regional workforce demands in this case. And quite frankly, it's also an infusion of, of attention and resources that is 
completely necessary. Um, and we have to continue to do this work. And we see in our case that the demand for our innovation fund grants continues to exceed the resources. So we're in this for the long haul and it is all about, um, yes, we're gonna call it P4 now, per perseverance, patience, passion and performance. Uh, great, uh, yeah, that's really inspiring, Maggie. Um, I, I can comment from, from the Cambodia perspective, uh, you know, what IDE have been able to do during the COVID uh, pandemic is, you know, because they've been so embedded within the communities within which they work, um, there's a lot of trust there and they've been able to work with the government to promote uh, hygiene messaging, uh, to, to hand out and, and promote the use of hand washing materials and, and, and other things. And, and subsequently, actually, they've been um, actively promoting the uptake of vac the vaccine program in Cambodia um, with, with government endorsement. Um, so they've been celebrated by the government for this. And I think it's a really good example of how, you know, that trust within communities uh, has enabled them to pivot and provide additional public health benefits um, at a time when a lot of communities really need it. Well, also, I love your question as we see 16 of us here virtually coming together on a screen about uh, how it's been affected. But I, I think, um, uh, supporting small businesses uh, translates well to digital. And, and if there's, it's, one can't really talk about a silver lining to a horrible global pandemic, but it has profoundly changed the way that we work. And I think we won't go back to working the way we did before. There's an, there's an efficiency to be able to touch base quickly with a, with a small business person. There's no need to bring them in in cohorts anymore as we used to. There's a great deal of efficiency to be gained and we're even seeing some superior results when we compare an in-person interaction to a digital one. We, we, I think both are necessary and the world will be hybrid as we all know, but um, there has been, this pivot has been helpful and has been the, uh, the, the partnership I described, that phase of it ended just as COVID was beginning, but as we've designed the next phase, it's very much with digital front and center. Since Alumnus America is dealing with health issues, you can imagine now that COVID hit uh, our countries, how difficult it has been uh, because of the priority and all the resources uh, um, uh, to tackle the pandemic. And what has been interesting for us is to see how this approach on the on, on system thinking and the way around uh, understanding the organizational and collective um, uh, behaviors and practices. Uh, the fact that these uh, targeted areas in the 20 poorest percent population have been doing this during the last 10 years, they were a little bit more ready to tackle something that was an emergency. And especially because they have been uh, improving their own information, health information system and surveillance. At that case, for maternal and neonatal uh, uh, death, but that's a, those are competences that then are used for other issues as well. So this is really important to acknowledge the work across the, the levels, not only for COVID in this case, yeah, but for any, any other emergency that we, we might have. And also to, to, to recognize the importance of, of uh, developing the competencies at the very local levels. And in addition, I think this, is a, a, I wish we had more time to discuss the issue of accountability as well, because that is a really important issue in partnership and one that we discuss a lot with uh, donors, especially. Who is accountable to whom? I mean, who is going to be held accountable here? And, and that's why in Salumes America, the work and the executors and the co-financiers co-responsible are the governments. So they need to be accountable and they are accountable to themselves first. And I, we saw experiences, uh, health, health providers in a small health center in Chiapas calling the, the state uh, minister of health in Chiapas, asking for what they were supposed to be providing to the local levels. And that is not possible when you don't have a, a target set, yeah, and responsibilities and roles. And that could also be said about uh, the, the formal partnership. So accountability is a real issue. And countries have, in, in this region with COVID, like eight months, according to the data we, we all together have collected, um, 
really like a drop in, in, in some, um, you know, other essential services. But they, since November last year, they are resuming like uh, the services for other services than, than COVID. And I think that's this, that, that gave us hope that uh, uh, resilience in the system and in, in the people in, in the health workers, in the community health workers, uh, this is an important issue. Not only the technical issues are, are important to build. Well, Tim, as you can imagine, without uh, energy, you can sit on platforms such as the one that we are seated on. So uh, I brought some level of agents to actually get this particular partnership to deliver so that we could support a cold chain in the clinic. We could also support some level of education during the pandemic uh, in an area that uh, is uh, generally disadvantaged. Uh, and by so doing, we address uh, SDG 10 that uh, is saying we reduce the uh, inequalities. So it, it's been a place where I would say the pressure has actually led to uh, a stronger partnership, so to speak, even with the community, where they don't feel abandoned. They feel like uh, they, they, they are people outside the immediate community that are also involved in looking after them. So it's been quite an experience and uh, from what should have been frightening, we've uh, derived value. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Clement. So I have one quick or one question from the audience that I would ask each panelist or partnership to answer in one to three words. So we're just gonna go very quickly, the very first thing that comes to mind. And then we're gonna to turn to Mary Margaret Frank from the University of Virginia Darden School of Business to ask a final question and to help close us out so that we can have an on-time conclusion. So my question for everybody, three words or less, it's a challenge, is if all of you had unlimited resources, what one thing would you do to scale your initiative? And if you can't say it in three words or less, you can hyphenate a word. This is your chance to scale, guys. <laughs> All right. Be, well, this is, oh, go ahead. Beyond sectors and beyond geography. Massive geographic expansion. Do it better. <laughs> well, get more involved. Get into detail and be on the ground. Okay. We can't hear you, Maggie. <laughs> Poor thing. On behalf of Maggie, it's resources, climate, and? Uh, more collaboration, four words. More collaboration. Okay, Mary Margaret, take us away. Well, that just, you can hear me, right? Okay. So that just set me up uh, when you brought up the word scale, because I've been taking notes about sort of what I've been hearing and when I think about the projects, a lot of what I've been hearing about is scale. So you have big projects, whether they're in sanitation, healthcare, electricity, education, right? These are things that social investment that requires lots of capital expenditure. We've got to finance lots of big, what we call CapEx, right? To get these things done. And so it takes a lot of funding, it takes a lot of financing. And so it seems like what we've been talking a lot about is to some degree, how do you share cost? How do you share the risk of the big cost to achieve the objectives? Very much project-based. And this is not a question, this is a challenge as we leave today. 
there's issue of scale and there's issue of sustainability. Those are very different things. So issue of scale is where do we find the funding, right? And how do we share the risk of making the deployment of capital to fund these re global expansion, as you put it, to look broader at more sectors, right? But sustainability is something different. Sustainability is asking, how do we, get, how do we create something that people are willing to pay for, okay? Such that we've created either because we've charged a price that's low enough that they can pay for it. So that the benefit to them is more than the cost. And so how, do, and that's about ecosystems. It's not just about one project. It's about how do we create ecosystems that are sustainable such they can live on. And I'll just leave that as the challenge for the next year. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mary Margaret. I think um, partnerships around the world are, are listening to that challenge and to thinking through that thought. And whenever I talk about the word sustainability, so much of it comes into a climate narrative, but when I use it, it's very much about that ecosystems, that element of continuation. If a partner were to leave or a new partner were to join, how would that change or evolve? But how would that also strengthen the ability of the project, the work on the ground to get done? Um, I want to say on behalf of Concordia, thank you so much to everybody for working through our tech challenges, working through hybrid, working through a global pandemic and bringing this really important content to partnering practitioners around the world. Congratulations again to our five finalists. We will be announcing the P3 Impact Award winner for 2021 tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will be live streamed across Concordia's website. I am confident that State Department, University of Virginia Darden School of Business will loudly, proudly push this out over social media um, and that our judges will continue their amazing work too to bring this challenge at work out there. So um, again, congratulations to all of our finalists. Thank you for the great work you're doing. And a big thank you to Mary Margaret, to Tomas, to everyone's teams who've been a part of this for this really strong partnership that Concordia itself is a part of through the P3 Impact Award. Have a great day, everyone. We've all learned a lot. You've earned another cup of coffee or maybe a piece of cake. All right. All right. Thank, so, you. thank you. Bye.